News of the Times. Wicked Wednesdays. Scorned. Jilted Partners and Vengeance. Welcome to News of the Times. In today's episode, we look at five cases involving jilted lovers between 1871 to 1910. In our first case, lodger Edward Roberts has fallen for the daughter in the lodging house where he is staying. She refuses his advances, which he does not take well. Our second case, from 1874, far less murderous, recounts the tale of a twice-jilted schoolmistress and the financial payments she extracts from him. Our third case, from 1892, takes place in the sleepy village of Melksham in Wiltshire, where a man, nearing the point of the marriage, is suddenly dropped by his bride-to-be as she discovers his enormous debts throughout the town. This breakup leads to two murders. Our fourth story from 1903 is a short case from France, where tears of overwhelming passion seem to have much more sway in sentencing than they have in England. Our last story from 1910 involves a prisoner in a long-term relationship which is suddenly cut off as she finds a different partner, not incarcerated, and marries him. Upon his release, the prisoner exacts revenge. Five stories of love lost and the actions taken by the jilted in today's episode of Wicked Wednesdays. We hope you enjoy the show. Our first story from 1872 is something of a medicinal miracle, albeit briefly. 35-year-old Edward Roberts lodged in the Merrick household. Here he fell for the daughter, Anne, who refused his advances. Robert waits for the mother's departure to church before exacting his revenge. From the Illustrated Police News, the 12th of August, 1871, murderous attack on a woman at Whitney. On Thursday last week at Whitney, Edward Roberts, gardener, about 35 years of age, was sent to the Oxford County Jail on the charge of attempting to murder a young woman named Annie Merrick by slicing off a part of the back of her head with an axe. The prisoner lodged with the girl's mother and he had proposed marriage to Anne and had been refused. Last week he discovered that she preferred a younger man. He swore that he would murder her. On Sunday morning, while the mother was at church and the girl was wiping up some water that she had spilt on the floor, when Roberts, without a word to her, got up from his seat near the fire, went into the back place and returned with an axe concealed behind him. Holding the handle with both hands, he aimed at the back of Merrick's head, and such was the force of the blow that he cut off a slice of her head, scalp, bone and brains. He then coolly put the axe back in its place and walked towards the police station to give himself up, expressing not the slightest contrition or regret. Somewhat to the surprise of the medical men, the girl has survived so far, but they consider that there is small hope of her living. Annie died of her wounds, and Edward Roberts was found guilty of her murder and executed by hanging in Oxford on the 18th of March, 1872. Our next story of jilted romantic partners does not end in murder, but is a window into the life of romance, promises and breaches of promises in Victorian England. Agnes, a schoolmistress, 
has been asked for her hand in marriage and has accepted. He is a businessman and it is a good match financially for Agnes. Everything is made ready, but then the groom-to-be gets cold feet and declines. This costs him. The groom pays the fine and then once again reconsiders. The bride-to-be forgives him and the second round of marriage preparations takes place. From the Liverpool Evening Express, the 19th of May, 1874, a fickle pawnbroker and a twice-jilted schoolmistress. A case of breach of promise, Agnes Brady versus John McEnorin, is about to come before the Scotch Court of Session. The pursuer is a schoolmistress, lately of the Roman Catholic school Wilshaw, where the defendant is a tailor and pawnbroker. He is about 20 years of age and states that she gave up her situation some time ago in order to get married to the defender who has, it is said, an extensive business in Wishaw. All went well till within a week of the proposed wedding when the pawnbroker changed his mind and informed the schoolmistress of the fact. She at once put her case into the hands of a solicitor, who, succeeding in getting matters amicably and privately arranged, the pawnbroker, it is said, paying over a sum of money for wounded feelings. Barely a fortnight has elapsed after this settlement when the pawnbroker sent a letter to the schoolmistress apologising for his past conduct and expressing deep regret in the way in which he had broken off the match. He concluded with a prayer for her forgiveness, and a postscript stated that he would call the following day, and promised that if she would listen to his suit, he would shortly make her a dutiful and loving husband. The interview came off, and both agreed to let bygones be bygones and Mr. McElloran proposed a trip to London. Miss Brady agreed to go, and they spent a fortnight in the metropolis and made large purchases for the wedding, which was now arranged to take place in a month. On their way home from London, the pawnbroker parted with his sweetheart at Liverpool, with she taking the train to Scotland and he the boat to Ireland, where he had some business, to transact. Some uneasiness was experienced by her and by other friends of the pawnbroker at his not turning up at the time he promised to return from the sister isle, but all doubts of his safety were laid to rest by his recent reappearance in Wishaw, where he brought home with him a young wife. The schoolmistress again put her case in the hands of a solicitor, and this time the damages are laid at £1,000, which is worth approximately £140,000 in 2024. Our next story from the lovely county of Wiltshire tells the tale of a man whose proposal of marriage has been accepted. The two are work colleagues in an asylum. Once the proposal has been accepted by the bride-to-be, the gentleman gives notice in his job as he will be moving to a new location with his future bride to set up house. Alas, the bride-to-be, Florence Adams, has a change of heart and declines to continue with the marriage. Her reasoning is she discovers that he owes money everywhere. He owes money to asylum patients, asylum staff, and all over town. Florence abruptly breaks off the engagement and wishes no more to do with him. He receives this notification by letter. The gentleman who we discover uses an alias, Louis Hamilton, in addition to his own name, John Gerd, is bereft at first, but then he is angry. 
Letters are sent to Florence of a threatening nature against herself and against members of her family. One confusing element of this case is the use of the two names, Louis Hamilton and John Gerd. Why has he two names he never made clear? Possibly it is related to his large number of debts accumulated. From the Warminster and Westbury Journal and Wiltshire County Advertiser, the 16th of April, 1892. In order to render the affair more intelligible, if not more interesting, it will be necessary to briefly glance at the facts which led to such a shocking termination. The prisoner, a young man named John Gerd, alias Louis Hamilton, aged 29, and a native of Shaftesbury, some two years ago became an attendant at the Wiltshire Asylum at Devizes, and while here an attachment sprang up between himself and a female attendant named Florence Adams, also a native of Shaftesbury. They eventually became engaged, and Gerd, a fortnight ago, left the institution to get married. Last Sunday week, the bands were published for the first time at St. James's Church in Devizes, but the girl subsequently broke off the engagement and refused to see the prisoner again. He wrote, threatening to murder her if she kept company with or married another, and also threatened to murder some of her relations, who he thought had poisoned her mind against him. On Saturday morning, the prisoner left his home at Shaftesbury and came to Warminster, calling at Crockerton on his way. At Warminster, he was seen drinking at the Mason's Arms Inn and other places, but he left the town by the 722 train in the evening for Melksham. Here he sought out a Mr. Richards, who resided in Semington Lane, and who was uncle to the girl. The two left the house together and walked along the canal side. When near the market house, and within sight of the police station, the prisoner took out a revolver and shot his companion. A policeman heard two reports of firearms and saw two flashes, and on hurrying to the spot found Richards in a dying state. Every assistance was rendered, but he died almost immediately, and the murder caused the greatest excitement in Melksham the next morning. Even now, Melksham is a small, sleepy town, so the murder of one of their own created great upset and excitement. Hamilton stroke Gerd traverses through Wiltshire from town to town, drinking his way in each village and attempting to evade the police. He travels through Froome and ends up in Causley. It is ten o'clock and the inns are shut. He pounds on the door of an inn and is told to go away. Hamilton stroke Gerd takes out his frustration and vengeance by shooting a horse that is tied to the post outside. The relations of the pub go out and see the damage done to their horse. Police are called upon and the search is now doubled for Hamilton stroke Gerd. It is now close to 3 a.m. and Hamilton stroke Gerd is being actively searched throughout the town with several police constables and sergeants involved scouring the area. From the Warminster and Westbury Journal and Wiltshire County Advertiser, the 16th of April, 1892, although it was shortly before 3 a.m. and he had only just arrived home after having been out until then in search of Gerd, Superintendent Pennant decided to at once go in search of the person who had shot the animal with the hope that he might be the prisoner. He accordingly aroused P.C. Mulden and sent P.C. Davis, who was on duty, 
for PC Langley, and shortly after three o'clock, these four started from Warminster in search of the miscreant. After proceeding just beyond the park oats, they observed a man approaching near Whitbourne Cottage. The constables were wearing helmets and were all in uniform, so that, presumably, the accused was able to distinguish them. Nothing was said by either party, and they continued to walk at the same rate as before until nearly abreast, when the prisoner, who turned out to be the man Gurd, addressing Superintendent Perrett, who was nearest to him, and said, Do you want me, sir? Here I am. The superintendent replied, I think I do for the murder of a man at Melksham. In an instant, the prisoner drew back a step or two and was just whisking a revolver out of his coat pocket when the superintendent closed upon him and grasping him around the waist threw him to the ground. Prisoner unfortunately managed to get his right hand in which he held a revolver under the superintendent's arm and when the other three officers rushed to their superior's assistance, he fired twice in rapid succession. The second shot struck P.C. Mulden, who was only a foot or so away, in the left side just near the heart, the bullet having apparently taken a downward direction. The sergeant exclaimed to P.C. Davis, Oh dear, Davis, I'm shot. Take hold of me. I'm dying. He then fell into Davis's arms, and they laid him on the ground. A desperate struggle then took place between Superintendent Perrett and the prisoner, but the former, having the prisoner by the throat, soon rendered him powerless, and before Gerd could fire again, P.C. Langley wrested the weapon out of his hand. Eventually the prisoner was overpowered and handcuffed, and shortly afterwards P.C. Reed and P.C. Chandler, who, singularly enough, must have followed not more than two hundred yards behind the prisoner from Causley, and who were attracted by the shots, arrived on the scene. The late Sergeant Mulden. The murdered sergeant was in his fiftieth year, and had been twenty-nine years in the Wiltshire Constabulary, out of which he had been eleven years as a sergeant. He only came to Warminster some three months ago, having for ten years previously been stationed at Shrewton. A distressing point of the case is that he had obtained leave of absence for Tuesday, the day he was shot, to go to Shrewton for the purpose of receiving a testimonial, consisting of a purse of twelve pounds and a marble clock which had been subscribed for by the inhabitants as a token of the esteem in which he had been held during his ten years' residence at Shrewton. He leaves a, a widow and four children to mourn his loss, and we are sure they have the sympathy of the town in their bereavement. Hamilton stroke Gerd is now held. The crowd is fiery, and Gerd, with his real name now discovered, is kept under tight security to protect him from an angry mob. He is moved the following day to Melksham, the scene of his first murder of the uncle of Florence Adams. The trial takes place and is very crowded from the onset. Particular interest is taken with the testimony of Florence Adams. Why did she break the engagement with Hamilton, the name by which she knew him? From the Warminster and Westbury Journal and Wiltshire County Advertiser, the 16th of April, 1892. Florence Louisa Adams deposed that she had known Louis Hamilton for some time at the asylum in Devizes, and had been engaged to him with the expectation of being married. The bands had been published in church for the second time on Sunday. He gave notice to leave the asylum on the 2nd of April and left on the 5th. 
Afterwards, she had a letter from him from Shaftesbury, where he lived with his mother. He said he had no father, and they were to be, have been married shortly. She states he owed a lot of money to the patients in the asylum, and not only to them, but in the town of Devizes as well. I wrote to him after he left the asylum to break off the engagement. I began with Mr. Hamilton, and I said I did not wish to have anything more to do with him after finding out his bad character by owing patients money, and not only poor persons, but people in the town. I told him if he wrote to me, I should not answer his letters. I received my information from Miss Spencer, the housekeeper at the asylum. Florence then produces a letter she received from Gerd as a response to her breaking off the engagement, which is read in court. Reference is made of her not waiting for him to clear debts and marrying another. My dear Flo, please forgive me for taking the liberty of writing to you again, but do please read this before you throw it into the fire. Oh dear, I am broken-hearted, and I have sent this to ask your forgiveness. My dear, I know I am guilty, but it is th through you, Flo, my dear, that I was in such difficulties. You know, Flo, my dear, or at least you must think that it has cost me a lot of money to do as I have when I have been out with you. Now, dear Flo, that I am ruined, you will look on me with scorn, but never mind. When I can, I will return to Devizes and pay every penny and follow you until the end of the world. I will have a bitter revenge some day, if not on you, I will on your old people or someone. Take notice of this, for I mean it, that is, if you give me up. But, oh, darling, please forgive me for the wrong I have done you, and don't get married to another just yet. Give me time, Flo, dear, to get over this and pay what I owe. I will pay every penny when I can. Indeed, I will, and have you too, my dear, if you will have mercy on me. Do ask Harry, Florence's own uncle, the murdered man, and Dad, to think of me as well as they may, for if any poor wretch was in need of their pity, I am now. Oh, Flo, dear, look at me. I have done no crime. I only owe some money, which I will pay as soon as I can. I am going to America. Now, dear, don't tell anyone where I am, my dear. I mean not to the police, for the sake of better times. I know you will not, my dear. I will take care of the ring until we meet again, and I know we shall some day, and then if you are a wife, you shall die. L. Hamilton. P.S. Oh, my dear Flo, have mercy on me. Don't get married. Medical evidence is produced recounting the wounds of Henry Richards and confirming that he had not killed himself. Testimony from the asylum where Florence worked is produced stating the good character of Florence. With the summing up, John Gerd, alias Louis Hamilton, is convicted of the murder of Henry Richards, the uncle of Florence Adams, and is executed in Devizes. Wiltshire, on the 26th of July, 1892. As he is already convicted of one murder, the second murder of Police Sergeant Mulden is not pursued in court. Our next case from France is a small news story. We include it as a contrast to English crime. Generally, we find in French crimes of passion a higher level of sympathy 
in the courts than we generally find for the same crime in English courts. From the Illustrated Police News, the 21st of February, 1903, a jilted suitor's brutal murder. A brutal crime was revealed at Angers Assizes in France, where Henri Delestre, a young farm labourer of 25 years, was sentenced to death for the murder of a girl named Rosalie Herdou. The man was an unsuccessful suitor, and revenge for her refusal of his offer of marriage, he strangled her with her own handkerchief, subsequently carrying her body on his back for over a mile to a lonely wood where he mutilated it in a shocking manner. During the trial, Delestre wept bitterly and begged to be let go, saying that he was more than sorry for his crime. His manner entirely changed when he was sentenced. A last story in this episode of Jilted Partners is from 1910. Thomas Craig is in prison where he has been for some time. Throughout the majority of his time there, his girlfriend has stayed true to him. But then she finds another romantic partner and marries him. Craig, from prison, promises revenge upon his release referencing Annie's dead mother. He is true to his word. From the Belper News on the 1st of July, 1910, Jilted Sweetheart's Revenge. Murder follows a threat from prison. Thomas Craig, a minor, was sentenced to death at the Durham Assizes on Saturday for the murder of Thomas William Henderson, who had married Craig's old sweetheart while he was in prison. The evidence was chiefly remarkable as illustrating the prisoner's determination to being revenged for being jilted. The prisoner was courting Annie Finn, a young woman who lived at Barnard Castle in 1903. In November of that year, he was sent to penal servitude and was able to communicate with her only by correspondence, and there was no doubt that for years she continued to be attached to him, and that the relations between them were those of an engaged couple. In September 1909, she made the acquaintance of Thomas William Henderson, and subsequently decided to marry him. A letter was sent to the prisoner by Mrs. Henderson's sister, informing him of that fact. On January the 4th, the following letter was written by the prisoner to Mrs. Henderson, who was then Annie Finn. You will see with sorrow when I come as you will go where your mother is. Well then, you will be like her in a few weeks' time next month, as my flesh and blood cannot stand this. I'm coming with letters and the photographs. I'll come like death itself. As you know, Annie, theirs is but to do and die, but you have only to die once, and I am not afraid to die and face death. I told you before, I am not going to live after I meet you. I will be sure to meet you like death that meets us all. Your happiness will be a short one. Again, I will forgive you if you are still Annie Finn, but if you are not, well, God help you, and to your mother you will go like a flash. On February the 5th, this young woman married Henderson and went to live at Gateshead. On March the 25th, the prisoner made his way to Gateshead, calling at Darlington and Barnard Castle. On March the 26th, he purchased a pistol and proceeded to Gateshead, where he found the house of Mrs. Henderson. It was there that the affray took place. Henderson, being mortally wounded 
and his wife also shot by the prisoner. The prisoner was caught some time after in a hayloft. When arrested, the prisoner said, I didn't mean to kill him, I only intended to wing him. And when charged later, he replied, I didn't intend to kill the man, I intended to kill Annie and then myself, and the reason I did not kill myself was because I didn't see Annie drop. Winifred Finn, a sister of Mrs Henderson, deposed. Craig called to see her on March the 24th. He burst into tears and asked, Where's Annie? Witness said she would not tell him. And Craig replied, I have got to know that she's at Newcastle, and said he would search Newcastle and Gateshead streets until he found her, and that if she did not speak to him, she would know what to expect. Craig added, If I meet her husband first, she will have no husband to go home to. Annie Henderson, widow of the deceased man, said she had intended to marry the prisoner since 1904, when the prisoner was sent to penal servitude. She had written him regularly, telling him she would wait till he came out. In September last, she changed her mind with regard to the prisoner, and after some conversation, wrote to tell him that the relationship between them must stop. On the afternoon of March the 26th, the prisoner was brought to her house, and after some conversation, the prisoner addressed her, said, Why did you throw me over? She replied, Because I loved my husband best. Her husband proceeded to hang a picture, and Annie sat down on a sofa nearby with her back to the prisoner. Suddenly there was a pistol shot, and her husband immediately jumped off the chair and crying, Oh, Annie, made towards the door. Prisoner then pointed the revolver at her and fired, and she felt that she had been hit in the breast. The prisoner was found guilty with a recommendation to mercy. Sentence of death was passed. Asked by the clerk of arraigns if he had anything to say, Craig quite unmoved, replied, I have nothing to say but this. I'm quite prepared to face death. Thomas Craig was executed on the 12th of July, 1910, in Durham. That concludes this episode of Wicked Wednesdays, Scorned, Jilted Partners and Vengeance. We very much hope you enjoyed the show. If you did enjoy the show, we will be grateful if you could like or subscribe to our little channel. We upload five days a week. Mondays are murderous as we delve into the dark side of Regency and Victorian crime. Wednesdays are wicked where we pull together stories with a similar theme, such as Doctors of Death. Fridays are frightful where we look at crimes in a location, such as stories from the stage to murder and scandal in the aristocracy. Saturdays is Serial Killer Saturdays, where we investigate serial killer stories from the past. And Sundays is a bit of fun, with a unique mini murder mystery, where you, the listener, have a chance to solve a murderous riddle. On the last Sunday of the month, we offer a two-hour compilation of stories based around a theme. Thank you again for watching and listening. This has been News of the Times, and I am Robin Coles.